thank you to those who had submitted questions. Uh, I will, what we'd like to do is, Carolyn, should I start over? I'm not sure. Do you want me to start over? Oh, Holly. no. That's okay. okay. All right. Uh, what we're going to do is thank you to those who submitted questions. What we'd like to do is after each section, uh, we will address any of the questions that you have just so we could stay more focused on those topics. And then if for some reason you forget questions, we'll try to save time for the end of the presentation to address those. And of course, if any question comes up after the webinar, please in, uh, email us at info at wavegp.com. We'll be happy to answer those. So really quickly, let's jump to the next slide, which is an overview of Wave Digital Assets. We were founded in 2018, primarily to serve a burgeoning need in the industry to support high net worth individuals, primarily crypto whales, and large institutions with their crypto exposure. We are one of the few uh, registered investment advisors uh, registered with the SEC that focuses almost primarily on digital assets. Our bread and butter is that we help some of the world's largest blockchain protocols manage their treasury, their bespoke customized services, but primarily their, their yields generating from derivatives to DeFi to staking. We also have several investment fund solutions, including early stage venture funds, one of the world's first Bitcoin derivatives funds, um, a crypto index fund, one of the world's first NFT funds, uh, DeFi fund, and even a tokenized whiskey fund. We've managed over two billion in crypto, and uh, a lot of that has been specialized in uh, more uh, alt tokens. And with that said, can you go to the next slide? I'd like to introduce to you David Seamer, who is our co-founder and CEO. Prior to founding Wave Digital Assets, uh, Dave also launched Seamer and Associates, which was a technology-focused investment bank, which he later sold to CEC Capital in 2016. He was also founder of Wavemaker Partners, which is an early-stage VC in Southern California. He is an early pioneer in the crypto space. He's been involved since 2012, uh, and he is passionate about the power of the blockchain to enable new generation of technology and innovation. He received his MBA in finance and international business from the University of Chicago. We also have with us Benjamin Tsai, who's president and managing partner and co-founder at Wave Digital Assets. He oversees product development and trading for the firm. He's a veteran in both Web3 and traditional finance, where he holds several senior leadership experience, including at Merrill Lynch, Asia, where he was the former CEO of MLSC, head of Asia Commodities, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, and he was the former head of Alternative Investments Asia Alliance Bernstein. Um, he is also the co-founder of LA Blockchain Lab and currently teaches crypto finance to the students of UCLA Anderson's Masters of Financial Engineering. With that said, I'd like to turn the time over to David and Ben. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks, Heidi, for the introduction. Um, so we'll, we're going to talk about a couple of things here, as Heidi mentioned. I mean, in, in general, we'll talk about the market. I think what maybe just jump to the next slide, and then we'll go back one. Um, you know, you were to talk a little every, the ETF is obviously the most topical thing right now. Um, and it's, you know, we do think it, it is kind of a landscape changing event. Uh, so, so still really excited. You know, what's happened so far with ETF is kind of exactly what we expected. Um, and this is really articulated, uh, kind of architected in this, uh, graph right here. Um, you know, a huge amount of selling of Bitcoins coming out of the Grayscale Trust. Uh, which is almost basically equally offset by buying of you know, new, you know, uh, new consumers buying Bitcoin through like the BlackRock ETF and whatnot. Um, and we ex expected this for a bunch of reasons. You know, we've been in space for a long time, known the Grayscale team for a long time. And, and, and how and I'll do a, little, a bit of backup and go through a lot of like Bitcoin math, if everyone can kind of bear with me for a second. Um, and, and kind of explain why the ETF is so impactful. And it really relates to mining rewards. Um, so right now today, and we have another happening coming up in a few months, but about 900 Bitcoins are produced every day, uh, which is a lot of Bitcoins. Uh, and most people, one thing people greatly misunderstand about, you know, the kind of price of Bitcoin and, and why there's always a lot of like kind of, you know, kind of, it seems like negative pressure on the price is because, you know, those 900 Bitcoins a day means about 330,000 Bitcoins come to market each year which at today's prices is about $14 billion of new Bitcoins entering the market every year through mining rewards. 
uh, which is a lot. You know, fourteen billion dollars is is a lot. It's a billion plus dollars a month. Um, and and you know, so that and that, so it's you know, so and when you think about the ETF coming out and what's attracted so far, it's been pretty amazing. You know, the first thing I wanted to kind of address is I you know spent a lot of time on on Twitter and and one of the bad narratives I've seen going around a lot recently is that a lot of the sellers of the Grayscale Trust are just rotating into the BlackRock, you know, ETF. Uh, and, you know, at least anecdotally, because I know a lot of whales that have very large positions in that trust, that is not the case. <laughs> it, it is not a recycling. Like everyone looks at the net number, which is net now today about $800 million uh, out of the, you know, $5.8 billion that's gone into the trust, um, into the, and sorry, into the 10 new ETFs. Um, and, and that's not the case. People that went into that trust a long time ago were doing a very different math in most cases. You know, you have to remember the Grayscale Trust traded at a premium for like whatever, I think almost like nine years or eight years. So for eight years, you if you had Bitcoin, which a lot of my you know friends and peers did, um, you could take that Bitcoin, put it in the trust, you had a six month lockup. And because it sold at a premium, you would then, you know, sell that to somebody else. You know, you could you could exit those coins into the open market. And for a long time, that premium was 20 to 30 percent. You know, so it was, it was a great trade. You know, while that trade lasted, it was a brilliant trade. And then suddenly that trade went away, <laughs> you know, back in, you know, kind of towards the uh, you know, middle of 22 with all the dislocations in crypto and bankruptcies and, and a whole bunch of bad news uh, that went to a very steep discount. And, and a lot of people were, you know, that bought into the GBC trust and bought in with, you know, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars from some individual entities we know, you know, got trapped there. Um, they all of a sudden, if they wanted to exit, they needed to exit at a 30 to 50 percent discount. Uh, which obviously is very, very painful. So so most of them held and they held as, until recently, you know, kind of everyone was hoping this event would finally take place and it finally did. And now they're able to sell and get out. But those are mostly like, you know, funds, like crypto hedge funds. It's a lot of the crypto kind of whales, as we call them, or, you know, the very, very wealthy crypto people. And they're not rotating into like an iBit trust, most likely, or iBit ETF. Uh, if they are going to buy Bitcoin again, they're just going to go buy Bitcoin. Like they they're, they have funds that hold naked Bitcoin. They don't need to pay somebody 25 basis points. Um, so our, our opinion is, and, there, and I'm sure there's some cycling, but our opinion is that, you know, most of the uh, volume going into these new ETFs is new buyers. Um, and if you look at it that way, it's absolutely incredible. You know, $5.8 billion absorbed in, I think, like 11 trading days. Um, you know, which is 100, about 138,000 BTC, uh, so almost 12,000 or almost 13,000 BTC a day. You know, so about 13 to 15 times the mining rewards is what these ETF, the new ETFs are absorbing every day, uh, which is a lot. Now, again, mining rewards are still massive. <laughs> uh, you know, so they're, you know, and so the, ha the happening coming up is really, really important. Um, and so, but, but, you know, these ETFs have been wildly successful. I mean, there's a lot of negative press, especially among the crypto people uh, I talk to that I don't fully understand, but they're like, oh, it's not that much. You know, we thought this price was going to soar. We thought this would be this amazing event. Obviously, a lot of people, myself included, um, you know, bought BTC prior to the ETF announcement coming out, thinking that would be a great thing to, to sell into. Uh, and that the price was going to go to 100,000. That didn't happen. A lot of people, not including me, you know, sold off a lot of those Bitcoins then. They were kind of over, uh, over levered or over, over allocated into Bitcoin, you know, hoping this was this incredible event and Bitcoin was straight to 100,000. Um, so it wasn't a surprise at all that we had to sell the news event, um, as they say, uh, that a lot, that a lot of the pricing, you know, pricing, you know, dipped down and it seems to be kind of stabilizing right now. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of Bitcoins that need to come out of the, the Grayscale Trust. Um, you know, we don't know how far down it will go. It'll, it'll probably go down 80%, you know, which means there's another, you know, 500-ish thousand Bitcoins that need to come out of that trust. Uh, and it's going to take, you know, so over, you know, and putting that in perspective again, you know, 500,000 Bitcoin, I mean, you're talking, you know, $20 billion. You know, I mean, if these new ETFs absorb $20 billion in the first year, I think, you know, most observers would look at that as a massive win. Um, so, so, it, so, it, you know, there, there's, there is going to be continue to be pressure on Bitcoin for a pretty long time, <laughs> uh, like a very long time. Um, but hopefully that pressure will slow. And and what we're also seeing with not seeing with the ETFs is we're not because we didn't see this big right run up in Bitcoin price. Yeah, you know, I don't think a lot of people got activated into looking at the ETFs that are not necessarily like already kind of crypto fans. Um, 
you know, but I think that will change. I think the price will run in the pretty near future. And I think you, when you see that kind of, you, you will see a feeding frenzy, which everyone, you know, too many people thought was going to happen sooner. I think it's probably, you know, two or three months away. You know, we will see the grayscale Bitcoin slow down. We'll, it, we'll continue to see a lot of, in, of interest in these ETFs for new, new, new holders. Um, and and we'll and I think we're really going to interesting to see some pretty powerful price appreciation pretty soon. That's, that's what I'm holding on for at least. Um, so so yeah, and then also just a couple of things on the ETF. Um, we at Wave and this is kind of backing out Wave a little bit and looking at kind of the general macro markets. You know, it's been an incredible you know last say three or four months. Um, you know, we Wave is a little bit of a bridge between the traditional world and the crypto world. So we've always had a lot of relationships with some of the larger asset managers in the world and hedge funds and whatnot. And, you know, there was a lot of interest right in the beginning of 22. And then that interest very obviously kind of disappeared for a long time. Uh, and then, you know, somewhat suddenly, and obviously the ETFs are probably a huge driver of this, you know, about three months ago, that interest has just really, really come back. Um, and, and obviously the, the ETFs coming out is just kind of one aspect of that. But even prior to that, I mean, we spent a lot of time with, you know, a lot of the largest, you know, you know, finance companies, banks, whatever the world. And every one of them now, you know, truly does have a crypto plan. You know, some of the plans are dumb, but they all have a plan. <laughs> they have a plan, at least for Bitcoin and Ethereum. They are offering it to their clients um, for a long time during the recent crypto winter, which may still be a winter. Uh, you know, crypto is a bad word. You know, the Goldman, you know, I use Goldman private wealth. They're not, they weren't allowed to tell their clients they had a crypto product unless the clients were actually demanding it. Uh, and that's actually still the case, kind of, which is kind of amazing. Um, but we're, we're seeing a huge thawing in that. Uh, and obviously the ETFs being approved and Bitcoin being, you know, now considered a, a you know, whatever, a normal asset uh, in the finance world, almost a normal asset, uh, it is a huge sea change. And I say almost a normal asset because I, I use two private banks and I have a like a Vanguard just you know ETF account. And through all three of those institutions, not one I've tried, not one of them will let me buy a Bitcoin ETF, <laughs> which is kind of staggering. Uh, so I started talking to a lot of other asset managers like the UBSs of the world and whatnot. And, and they also they will if you demand to have the ETF in your portfolio, in some cases they will give it to you, but it is not listed. It is not on like most of these platforms yet. Uh, our best guess is, you know, probably well under half of all consumers actually have the ability right now to go buy these ETFs, any of them. Um, and if you're on Fidelity, you can get Fidelities. If you're on a few other platforms, you can get some, you know, but but mo for most cases, they're hidden. And unless you act, and, and some of them will unhide them if you actively inquire. Uh, but it is kind of amazing that an SEC approved product I mean, you know, Vanguard has been adamant, Merrill Lynch has been adamant, Goldman, that they will not allow you to buy these products in any way, shape or form, even if you ask them to as a high net worth client, uh, which, which is just kind of staggering. Uh, but I think that also is a huge factor in, in kind of why we haven't seen an even, you know, even faster adoption of these ETFs. Um, so uh, anyway, so, um, so I'll pause there on the ETF side. Um, and let me pause for questions about that. Then I'll kind of go into more of the general general market, I guess. Thanks, David. Yes, we did receive a question as it relates to the ETF, and it is, when will Bitcoin reach 100,000? <laughs> and uh, also, how do you see the passing of these ETFs affecting altcoins? Sure. So the 100,000 question I get a lot, and I, I don't know. I, I, I actually am, am very bullish. Uh, again, there's a lot of Bitcoin sell pressure coming right now, uh, and it's going to continue. I mean, you know, there's, I said, 20 billion coming out of the, you know, the Grayscale Trust combined with the usual $14 billion worth of mining rewards per year. Again, that, that cuts in May um, is, is a lot of sell pressure, you know, so so the ETFs will do a lot of that. There's a lot of non ETF Bitcoin buying that will cover a lot of that as well. Um, I, I do think we're probably going to be stuck where we are for a couple months, maybe or maybe a month. Uh, I, I do. Yeah, you know, my hope is we just the Grayscale unwind goes fast, <laughs> even if it means Bitcoin drops down to like 30K or something like that. So I, I, obviously, we just need to get it over with as an industry. Uh, it's an enormous amount of assets. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it'll it's going to put negative pressure for a long time. So, the, you know, the worst case scenario is, you know, it bleeds out, 
you know, whatever, you know, $50 million a day for, you know, the next, you know, two years or something like that. So I mean, eventually we'd overcome that self-pressure anyway, but, you know, but, and I don't think that would be the case. I, I do think the people in that trust want out, they're paying two and a half percent to hold Bitcoin. Uh, it's a bad product. Um, now, that, now that the shackles are off, I, I mean, I, as far as I can, as far as I know, and this is more rumor, the only real gate, the only reason the numbers coming out of that trust haven't been massively higher is they can't process them fast enough. <laughs> that it's, it's a human logistics issue at this point of getting letting people come out of that trust um and then hopefully go back into it if you're grayscale um so 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 i think that's i think there is a lot of pent-up demand i do think we'll see you know a full maybe you know i think it's about five billion now is left i think we'll be at 10 billion in another couple of weeks and that's a lot that, that's a third of the whole trust you know uh you know taken you know taken down um, as far as far as when we hit 100k, I, I do think shortly after that selling pressure ebbs, we'll see something really interesting. <laughs> um, or I'm I'm betting on it, of course. So I mean, I I do think there's a lot of demand. I do think in the next couple of months, it's going to get harder and harder for whatever you know the vanguards of the world and everybody to not allow people to buy an SEC approved product. It's just it's just very bizarre. I, I really we, we tried to look and I couldn't find a precedent. Maybe there is a precedent, but I, it seems really unprecedented that <laughs> hey, there's there's major ETFs by the largest issuers in the world, Fidelity and BlackRock, um, and and Vanguard just says no, we're not going to allow people to buy. They don't block almost anything else. You know, they don't block block like oil, tobacco, firearm stocks, as far as I know, um, but Bitcoin. <laughs> no one can have Bitcoin. Uh, but it's so it's very weird. So I, I think that'll change very quickly, though. Um, it, it doesn't seem like the most tenable position. Uh, I think a lot of it's not that hard to switch ETF providers. Also, if you're on Vanguard platform, and you want to switch to Fidelity. It's, it's not that many mouse clicks to move it over. Um, so. So I don't think they take too long. Um, and oh, sorry, what was the second question? Besides yeah. So, so there's a well. The second question was um, how does it, how do you see it impacting altcoins? Yeah, I mean, I think all coins are have a great run. Um, and, and mostly, you know, when when Bitcoin went down, you know, you know, obviously Bitcoin went from sixty nine to to sixteen k, you know, eighty percent down. At that same point, all altcoins on average were down like ninety three percent or ninety four percent, and that's the major altcoins. Um, so there's still a long way to go back. Bitcoin is currently, you know, thirty five or forty percent off its its all time high. And pretty much every altcoin will take Solana out, but even Solana is still down, you know, 70% from its all-time high. You know, I mean, if you're on the list, you know, Cardano is down, you know, still probably 85%. Uh, you, know, just math, you know, many multiples further down than, than Bitcoin is. Um, so just on a natural reversion to mean, you know, if Bitcoin does, you know, kind of reachieve, say, 70K and hold it for a minute, you know, that's only 60% up from here, but I think we'll probably see alts, you know, th go three or 400% up, you know, at least get most of the way back to where they were from their all time highs. Now, if you use like, you know, Cardano, which is, you know, 48 cents, you know, I think if Bitcoin holds that level, it'll at least go back to a dollar fifty. you know, it was 320 for a minute, you know, a long time ago. So, you know, so if you're, if you're trading and you're, you know, you're looking for the highest returns, you know, I, we, I love altcoins right now. Um, I think that's going to be where a lot of heat is. You know, it's, the narrative around Bitcoin is going to be the only narrative for the next probably six months uh, on a on a macro scale. But you know, but those coins are are still you know way undervalued from at least you know, if you assume they were ever reasonably valued, which is a different assumption. Uh, but they're they're massively down from where they were. Um, so David, just to keep in mind of the timing here, we've got two more questions on this, and and then we can move forward if you'd like. Um, oh. Actually, a whole bunch of other questions just popped up. Um, so really quickly, which altcoins would you recommend in particular? And then we're going to go back to the Grayscale um, ETF discussion for a moment. Uh, sure. I mean, I the, for me, I mean, there's a lot of great projects in crypto. I'm, I'm, I do buy altcoins. You know, the, the ones I'm mostly looking at are the ones that are down the most from you know, kind of the, the 2021 highs. Uh, but I think the math is just kind of simple. If it's a good project, you know, I still... You know, really like you know Cardano, I like Avalanche, you know Polygon. Uh, so I I do play mostly in kind of the larger coins with my own portfolio. Wave itself manages a lot of small coins, so I have some exposure to the very long tail alts. Uh, and obviously, I'm an investor in our in some of our VC funds. Um, but I, and, and some of the newer coins that are coming up, I also really like Injective, C, 
Uh, like I liked Hedera for a long time. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's a hard question to answer, <laughs> uh, but there's a lot that I think are, are really, really promising. Um, you know, so, but, but it's, but I think, I think, you know, a lot of all, if someone is building an alt portfolio, you should build a very diversified portfolio because there's such a, you know, systemic risks in each coin. Um, but, you know, the, if you just own, you know, a lot of the top like 40 coins, I think you, you'll outperform Bitcoin over this next cycle by, you know, probably 2x, but it, you know, it takes a little bit more work. So jumping back to the ETFs really quickly, we've got two questions. One is, why do you think Grayskull wouldn't just cut their fees to stem the outflows? Well, we'll start with that. And then I've got another last question. It's too painful. I mean, the average ETF is 25, it's zero right now. BlackRock um, and Fidelity and Bitwise all promise to charge zero basis points for the first year or until the ETFs at like 5 billion or whatever, whatever number it was, but depending on which one they were. Um, so you're, you're cutting to zero is painful <laughs> when you're charging two and a half percent to do absolutely nothing. I, mean, I think what a Bitcoin ETF is, it's the greatest financial product in the world for a, an asset issuer. There's no rebalancing. There's nothing to do. The accounting is insanely simple. It's just the price of price discovery. I mean, it is the, you know, it's even compared to like a basic money market fund. Money market funds are like really hard by comparison. They're hard. But by comparison, they're really, really hard, you know, a cash money market fund. Um, so it's a fantastic product, you know, forever, you know, that ATF, you know, the, the GBTC trust is averaged like $30 billion, you know, two and a half percent of $30 billion, you know, it's $700 million a year. And you need no staff. Like they have, you know, they outsource everything, like accounting and audit, they outsource custody. <laughs> you know, I'm sure they have a team inside that does marketing and stuff like that. But it's, you know, it's, it, there's almost nothing to do with the product. It is a beautiful product. So I, I'm sure what Barry is hoping, yeah, again, what Barry I'm sure is hoping on is say, say of that, th that 30 billion after a year becomes 10 billion, like I said, you know, 10 billion at two and a half percent is still $250 million a year. Or you could charge 25 basis points right now and keep, maybe you keep more of that 30 billion. But what's 25 basis points on 30 billion? It's not, it's not a lot of money. It's $75 million a year. <laughs> You know, so yes, you know, long term, that might be more viable, but I would probably do what Barry's doing and just assume that a lot of investors are lazy, which they are, and it'll take a long time for a lot of people to bother to redeem. You know, you see that in financial products all the time. You know, a lot of people just don't pay attention once they own something. They just kind of leave it. Um, so I, I, I assume that's the calculus. And again, what's the what's the break even on that analysis? I mean, you know, even if, even if he holds on to 10% of the coins, he's better off charging the two and a half percent. So this segues nicely into the next question, which is moving away from Bitcoin ETFs into uh, alt token ETFs and possibly with those ETFs having more actively managed uh, requirements. Do you see actively managed ETFs and ETNs emerging so it's not just new tokens being approved, but also having different underlying strategies. So it's not just about holding the digital assets, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we're already seeing it on Bitcoin. So there's some really fun, you know, there's like there's covered call ETFs or you know, if, you know, ETFs on Bitcoin already. There's some really cool yield ones. Um, I'm them up looking at myself. There's one where they hold like, you know, 100% of the money in T-bills and then they, they just buy call options on Bitcoin. Um, so which is kind of a clever strategy, you, you know, obviously you don't take, you know, you can lose money on the calls, um, you know, by, by writing them all the time, but, you know, but you're, it's kind of interesting way to play the volatility aspect of Bitcoin. And, you know, I mean, as long as you can buy long enough duration, you know, call options, I think it's a really cool strategy that, that could end up working really, really well for, for investors. So we're already seeing lots of different financial products, um, come around this, you know, Bitcoin still lends at, you know, four or 5% a year, if you want to borrow it. Um, at scale. Uh, so I think there's going to be, there's always going to be a large lending market, which is another, you know, style of yield strategy has not been a riskless strategy to say the least in crypto these last few years. Um, <laughs> you know, but when it's, you know, Fidelity doing it or something, I think it would be a, a good strategy. And, you know, they probably wouldn't be safe enough not to lose the coins. Um, and then on, on, as far as other altcoin ETFs, I, you know, obviously I think we'll see an Ethereum one. I think, I think sooner than I think a lot of people expect, I don't think it'll take a year to get an Ethereum ETF. Uh, now that they kind of broke the floodgate, you know, obviously, depending who's in power, it seems like that'll happen in some uh, reasonable time frame. You know, there have been uh, lots of altcoin listed products in Europe for years, uh, and they haven't done well, quite frankly. Um, you know, there, I think there's literally like 150 ETPs and ETNs like on the Six Exchange, Nord Exchange, Deutsche Bourse. 
Uh, I think they've gathered, if you look at just the altcoin portion, I think they only gather like a billion dollars, which is not that successful. Um, but we've kind of seen what can happen with real ETFs. You know, there, there is a huge difference. Um, I think we will see other jurisdictions, you know, everyone competes, you know, so, you know, as soon as these ETFs came out on Bitcoin, you know, that, that was the bread and butter of a lot of the uh, tiny you know, European exchanges like six, you know, they, you know, at one point, uh, like a $3 billion coin shares ETN. And they had a couple other one and 21 shares had another one or I don't know, whatever they call it now, uh, and a whole bunch of others. But most of it was kind of Bitcoin over there. And, you know, obviously those numbers got destroyed by these new ETFs coming out um, by these major players. And they come with real distribution and, and awareness. And, you know, I see the bit BlackRock marketing campaign everywhere and Fidelity's uh, on chasing their own social media. And I probably clicked on a bunch of links, so that probably makes sense. But I'm, I'm guessing they're doing a lot of advertising. Uh, but I think we're now going to really see the rest of the world have to compete. So like Singapore exchange is now supposedly looking at be, trying to be the first is a rumor I heard uh, to launch an Ethereum, you know, true spot ETF. Um, there's a whole bunch of others jurisdictions that are saying, OK, we don't want to let the, the U.S. just kind of run away with this. You know, and it's so so the, I think you're going to see a lot of those around the world. I think we'll won't see them in the U.S. for a couple of years, um, depending on who, who's in power. You know, assuming if Gens are still there, at least. <laughs> So I think um, just keeping in mind, we're about half past the hour. Um, if you do, if the audience does have more questions, again, please post them. We'll do our best towards the end of each section to answer them or the end of the event as well. Please feel free to email them at info at wavegp.com. So Dave, please jump to the next topic. Uh, sure. And um, I guess, I, unfortunately, it's impossible to talk about crypto without talking about regulation. So so let me let me talk about that for a few minutes. Um, and, you know, the regulation is, in, well, it depends where you are in the world. So globally, regulation last, say, two, three years has gotten phenomenally better. Um, not in the U.S., <laughs> not in the U.K., but in most of the world, uh, it's been pretty amazing. You know, so Asia is, you know, has been leading on this for a long time. Uh, first with Japan. Um, you know, Japan's been an amazing regulatory environment. Every major bank in Japan, at least all the top five, have custody solutions, trade digital assets. Uh, have, you know, top four banks have been given licenses to issue, you know, crypto style stable coins um, and, and so on and so on. So, that, you know, so we're seeing, you know, a huge amount of you know, positive news out of all the Europe, all the Asian countries, at least except China. And even China has come back. They unblocked, you know, mining. They approved exchanges in Hong Kong again. Uh, they're approving asset managers and custody licenses in Hong Kong and Macau, at least. But that everyone but they've in, you know, kind of told people that that will translate to the mainland as well pretty quickly. Um you know, the Middle East is, is is the hottest spot for crypto right now. Um, every uh, country in the Middle East is basically trying to outcompete on better or more favorable crypto legislation. You know, it started with Dubai and then, you know, Abu Dhabi <laughs> wrote even more favorable laws. And then is, you know, Saudi Arabia wrote even more favorable laws. And then Bahrain and uh, Qatar are all just trying to become these places for crypto. And, and, the, and the legislation that's coming out of those places is absolutely amazing for a crypto fan. I mean, it's basically you can do anything. You know, you want to issue a token and have, you know, perfect legal protection that it's not a security, at least in those jurisdictions and all kinds of blockers from liabilities and so forth. You know, everything you would dream of as a crypto issuer, crypto exchange, custodian, you know, the, you go to the Middle East. <laughs> you know, the laws there are beautiful. Like, you are protected. You know, there's a, there's a reason you know Binance and all the other exchanges you know move there. Um, so now the U.S. is a mess. Um, the, in Europe with Mika, Mika two has also been doing a lot of great things. Some of those laws they're proposing are lousy, but they're actually pretty open to addressing them. It sounds like they're going to address the staking issue. They were going to put this weird capital requirement around staking, which is kind of silly because staking is not even risky in most cases. Um, so anyway, so so Europe is, is is being you know kind of also way ahead of the U.S. on, on a lot of fronts, um, and then what you see in the U.S. Well, so everyone knows the negative things in the U.S. Gensler has been attacking lots of companies. Um, he's nowhere near done, <laughs> from what we we hear. Uh, there, he's still got a a long list of of you know players he wants to bring actions against, and you know I think he, his his view on this seems to be I let the Bitcoin ETF go out. See, look, I'm not really that negative on crypto, or I'm not irrationally negative on crypto, and then he's going to redouble his efforts on altcoins and you know exchanges and wallets and and DeFi and things like that. Um, so it, it's kind of bizarre, like, you, you know, all, after all the losses Gensler's experienced in court, you know, most 
SC, you know, most government officials would, you know, kind of lick their wounds and, and pick something else, go, go fight AI for a while or go fight, you know, you basic, you know, traditional finance fraud, like overdraft fees, but no, he's, he's, he's still pretty focused on crypto <laughs> and still got a lot more to do. Um, but we do see it kind of thawing or we see it thawing mostly is at the state level, you know, so we're seeing a lot of state initiatives now, um, that especially the red states, um, that are saying, they think Gensler is ridiculous. This is way overbearing. There is no precedent, you know, I guess, outside of like the drug war or something of, of people doing basic financial things that aren't violating any written laws and getting this level of, of kind of, I guess, you know, just kind of attacks and whatnot. Um, so so we're seeing a lot of states, you know, Texas, Wyoming and you know, Florida are really kind of leading. There's a bunch of others that are putting out their own legislation and their own laws. And, you know, Wyoming put out a whole thing called Speedy Banks, which is a whole framework for regulating, you know, crypto banking um, and so forth. Uh, and, you know, the Fed is, is challenging a lot of these things, um, but it's, you know, it's going to lose those fights over time. You know, it just is. So, and, and obviously we'll talk a lot about, well, I'll, I'll pause I'll pause there again. We're, we're going to talk about real world assets and decentralized finance, which I think is like the most exciting aspects of what's going on in crypto right now. Maybe I'll pause there and just kind of on the regulation side and see if we have any questions. No major questions, although I did receive one of, do you think that there will be, is there any hope for um, a softening in the regulation in the US? Yeah, not now. <laughs> in the next 12 months, no. I, we we see only signs and many signs that it, it's going to be just what we've seen so far, but there's going to be more names getting tagged. Um, so I, I have no illusions right now that we're going to get a, a better U.S. regulatory framework. Um, but we're also seeing kind of different things. And we're seeing Larry Fink at BlackRock being the world's greatest crypto salesman in the last, you know, three weeks. Um, and, you know, and, and, and we've seen very different narratives suddenly coming out of you know, even some of the pretty stodgy, you know, you know, banks like the Goldman's of the world, you know, are, are suddenly, you know, like, hey, there's a new financial asset we can make money off of, um, <laughs> you know, and those, those, they have very strong, you know, voices and what policies get written and how things are done. Um, so I, I think there's finally meaningful counterweights to Gensler. There wasn't before. You know, I mean, you know, no one, you know, Gensler could care less what anyone in the crypto world thought about him. He does care a lot of what Goldman and BlackRock and Fidelity think of him. You know, those are some of his future career paths, possibly. So, we're, so, but, but, yeah, but on, on the for the other kind of companies like the other token issuers, altcoin issuers, and whatnot, yeah, I think there's still a lot of uh, news to come. Not, not, not good news. Well, hopefully with some of those business leaders in this space that will help move crypto regulation along in a more sustainable way. Um, but that that was the main question we received on that section, David. Sure. So let's go to the next slide, I think it is. So real world assets. So um, this is kind of a crypto term. So uh, backing up a little bit again. So the obviously, well, what real world assets are. They're, that's the, you know, $16 trillion in, you know, or more than that. Uh, and stocks, bonds, you know, mortgages, you know, all, all the things in the real world, you know, houses, prop, real property. Uh, and there's obviously that's that's all, the whole financial world. Um, and in the crypto world, we've created, you know, over the last, say, three years, have built an enormous amount of software infrastructure around decentralized finance. Uh, and what all of the those software platforms do is, in you know, mi mimic sometimes poorly, but sometimes well, um, the, the various aspects of the traditional finance world. So where the traditional world has the New York Stock Exchange, you know, you know, crypto has Uniswap, you know, where there's, you know, bank lending and whatnot, crypto has like Aave and Compound. Uh, and, you know, and, and then because of the regulations and, you know, obviously the traditional world is highly regulated, all those things are securities or bonds or CFTC, you know, monitored or whatever. Um, there's been, a, it's been very hard to figure out, you know, how can we take all these kind of amazing tools that that is what, you know, decentralized finance and crypto is. Um, and, and just to be kind of clear, so, so DeFi is built like everything. We have, you know, all sorts of synthetic asset platforms, we have, which are like stablecoin issuers, other types of things like wrapping, you know, Bitcoin and other types of assets. Uh, we obviously, exchanges, lenders, you know, everything, pretty much every piece of the financial world has been rebuilt in, in, a, in a DeFi way on a software layer that anyone can access without permissions. 
you know, everyone, everything is posted. There's all, you know, they do audits of the platforms. It's a, it's a risky world still. There's lots of exploits and, you know, and the software doesn't always work perfectly. Um, but we've spent, you know, but hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars was invested by different, you know, crypto VC funds and investors to, to build out all these features. And the future in our world mind is, you know, how do you marry those two worlds? And, and you have to think about the emerging markets kind of first when you think about merging these two worlds. Uh, in the first world, everyone has pretty good money. Our money is digital. Most people that, that want to in the US or Europe can get access to the stock markets, can buy whatever. You know, but that's, that's only true for about eight, really true about 800 million people out of 8 billion people. You know, if you're in, you know, Africa and, you know, if you're really wealthy in Africa, sure, you have access to, to you know, brokerage accounts and, and better banks and whatnot. You know, but there's only, I think, something like 50 million bank accounts in Africa. It's 1.2 billion people. Um, it, it's not many. <laughs> uh, and, if, and it's even lower if you look at things like like true accessibility. A lot, a lot of those, whatever, a lot of people have more than one bank account. Um, so it's even worse than it sounds. Um, so and, it's, and, it, and not that dissimilar in like parts of like Southeast Asia and India and, and kind of like, you know South America. You look around the world. And, you know, but everywhere does have a middle class. So the, the kind of prototypical case I use for why this decentralized finance is going to be so massive uh, is, you know, think of someone in, you know, someone in Kenya that has like $20,000 in savings, you know, which is, you know, which is very upper middle class of, of Kenya, pretty, pretty poor country still. Um, and that person doesn't have a bank account. You know, he can't buy and, and they can't buy dollars. You know, the, what do you want if you're in Kenya? There, last year, the shilling depreciated 60% against, you know, basket of world currencies. Uh, so lousy. So if you're trapped and only have shillings, you know, you'll do almost anything to get dollars. Uh, so in crypto, we have a, a token, that, a stable coin called USDT or Tether. Uh, there's about 90 some billion dollars of it. Almost $40 billion of it sits in Africa. And it's people that just want dollars. They're, like, they're actually willing to go through all the crypto machinations and, and, and the kind of the risks of Tether itself, which is not the most transparent coin um, and everything else. But they're desperate to hold a currency that isn't the local currency. And, 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 and you need to understand how different that world is. You know, I mean, so in most of that, several countries in Africa, Bitcoin is illegal. But in almost all those countries, U.S. dollars are also illegal. Like a U.S. hundred dollar bill is is as illegal as Bitcoin in like Zimbabwe and Burundi and you know a bunch of these countries because they're trying to force the local people to use the local currency. That's how the government stays in power. They don't collect taxes very often or very well, so they print money and they just devalue it. And if no one holds the money, then they can't print that much more money because it would just devalue that much faster. Um, so we're seeing, you know, the first thing we're seeing is a whole bunch of these, probably led by Franklin Templeton, well, not in reality, but at least kind of uh, by, by name recognition, you know, of tokenizing a basic money market fund. So money market funds are pretty simple, pay 5%. Um, they've tokenized theirs, allowed it to go into, into decentralized finance, and now and they haven't turned all the, all the restrictions off. But eventually, you know, middle class family in Africa, you know, if they have, you know, $2,000 of savings, they can put that in U.S. dollars. And get five percent a year, which which is to them is like the greatest financial product you could ever imagine. It's kind of hard to rip back, right? <laughs> visualize if you live in the first world, but like that is their dream, uh, or or you know even better like a BlackRock S and P five hundred fund. You know if they have some savings and they're kind of a longer term investor. So quote, quoting uh, quoting like Larry Fink, you know I mean he uh, you know they hired a couple hundred people apparently at BlackRock so far to tokenize all of their index funds. Uh, you know, Fidelity is doing the same thing. Fidelity Digital Assets actually has almost 2,000 people. And the whole thesis is, you know, I mean, this is exactly what leaders of both companies have said, you know, 7 billion people can't access my financial products. You know, if I put them, you know, just because of the, you know, the socioeconomics of the world. But if I put them on chain, suddenly that's 7 billion more people. Again, it's not the wealthiest 7 billion people, um, but 7 billion people is 7 billion people. Um, you know, and why wouldn't someone with, you know, $5,000 of savings in, you know, say Argentina or something want to have U.S. dollar money market fund and uh, S&P 500 shares? Um, so and, and lots of other things. And those are like the most basic products. I won't go into like the depths of, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of other products, you know, you go into like mortgage loans and all sorts of other things that are higher yield or commercial debt. Uh, those things take a little take a little bit longer. Um but just those couple of basic products are just absolutely transformative for people that, you know, are, are, you know, under these horrible financial regimes in their own countries. I mean, if, you know, what, what is inflation? You know, the rich people don't pay inflation. Their, their assets are indexed. They own land, they own stocks. You know, the, the poor people bear the brunt of inflation. 
Um, and, and in places where inflation is, you know, 20 plus percent a year, it just, it's just, just you know, soul crushing. <laughs> you know, there's no way to have savings. Um, so, so we're seeing this go very quickly. Um, I think in the next two, three years, you're going to see just, you know, trillions of dollars go into these decentralized platforms. Um, and, you know, and, and that'll, you know, and that, that's really the whole premise of crypto. Like when I got really excited, I got a little bit excited about crypto in the early days, you know, 12, you know, 13. Um, but really in 2016, when I made the decision to dedicate, you know, my financial life to crypto, it, it was because of that. You know, I was an early stage investor, you know, mostly in Southeast Asia, where we saw all these challenges, you know, trying to get payment rails and and give people, you know, digital wallets in their phones, you know, back in that era. And, and this is just kind of the end game of all that. You know, this this is what, you know, crypto is kind of made for to be these kind to be able to move these types of financial assets around the world seamlessly, almost costlessly um, and so forth. So David, we did receive a few questions on that. And your your last line was moving assets across the world seamlessly. And the question is, with recent compliance and regulatory issues here in the United States, um, almost anti-crypto, do you think that moving forward with real world assets that this that there will be as much of a struggle or will this be a much simpler process? It'll be a struggle because there's a lot of control aspects. So, you know, S&P 500 shares are a security. Moving securities around DeFi without AML KYC violates, you know, not all, but most countries' uh, regulatory laws. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a lot of chaos. And so the first thing we're seeing is regulated decentralized finance. And I kind of see that as, you know, it'll be it'll be a big part of the future. Uh, I wouldn't say it's just the training wheels. I mean, it's, it actually... You know, for people that want to do these kind of transactions in the U.S., you know, this, you know, a, a copy paste of, you know, say like Aave, if they want to be like a lender or something like that, um, you know, that they can, you can do a regulated version that has, you know, only allows whitelisted wallets to interact with it. People can go through all the different AML KYC type procedures, and all you're really doing is you're just taking out the middleman, which is, in you know, today is the bank. Or if it's, you know, trading S&P 500, you know, tokenized shares, you're just doing it through a regulated, you know, um, you know software based uh, broker as opposed to the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so that would be so the, the, in the first world, we're, we're see, just seeing the emergence of a lot of regulated platforms where they have kind of end to end regulation. Everyone has to go through all sorts of processes to get into the platform, you know, go through a net key <laughs> or, or, or style type, you know, AML KYC type process. Uh, and then there'll be the Wild West. You know, if you're in the Middle East, you know, all of them have now our writing laws where that's not the case. These assets can just be in the wild. Uh, so we do think we're going to see a, a true bifurcation of the, I guess, the financial world. There already is true bifurcation. But, you know, we'll see the first world, you know, the larger, you know, first world economies will all probably go the regulated route, which is which is fine. I mean, it's just software. Uh, it's not that hard to do, quite honestly. Uh, and there'll be a lot of resistance from some of the incumbents, of course. But then I think on the, you know, the more wild west part of the world, you know, think, you know, small, you know, Africa, South America, a lot of places, you know, our people are just going to do the non-regulated side because it's it's easier, it's faster. Um, and and I don't think anyone's going to try to stop them. A lot of those countries have a lot larger problems, <laughs> like revolution type problems than, than they do, you know, trying to figure out if someone's, in, you know, managed to get S&P 500 shares. Um, so, so, so what we're going to see the world bifurcate, uh, I think eventually the regulated side will be the much larger side, but obviously that's where more, more of the dollars are. And for ourselves, we, we operate, you know, a couple of crypto funds, uh, and VC, early stage VC funds in the space. And that's, you know, probably our entire focus, I would say is, you know, investing in the technologies that enable these things. So that's, you know, regulated kind of persistent identity, you know, type wallets, uh, ex you know, regulated exchanges, regulated lenders and whatnot. Uh, and a lot of different other kind of all the different pieces you need around that, you know, you, you know, how do you, how do you maintain someone's identity confidentially through all of these, you know, hops going through all these different things. So next question, uh, assuming that we do see this large growth and regulated DeFi, do you see that there's a lot of opportunity for ETPs or maybe even ETFs for uh, these real world assets? Um. Well, real world assets already have all that. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question, but the real world assets we're bringing are listed. We don't need an ETP. There's, it's, I, you know, BlackRock's, you know, S and P 500 fund. <laughs> you know, so we. I think, you know, I think the tokenization of those real world assets. So. 
Well, they'll be tokenized, but you don't need an ETP at that point. ETP is a, is a bad listing relative to a formal you know, ETF listing. Uh, so I think what you'll see is, I mean, we, the tokenization of all that is is happening. I mean, there, you know, I, I think every one in finance, except for Vanguard, uh, that does <laughs> have a portfolio of lots of mutual funds and ETFs or whatever, you know, sees this potential. I mean, you know, with, with you know the CEO of BlackRock talking about it all the time, it, it's kind of hard to avoid. Um, and so, so I think that's going to happen, you know, that now, again, how everyone accesses that. But to me, the interesting thing about tokenization is bringing non-traditional assets. So tokenizing S&P 500 shares or money market funds, great. It, the technology is quite simple. Uh, you can pick a chain you want to do it on. You issue, you issue a token. That token is not very intelligent. I mean, it's just it's basically a receipt. You know, those tokens will look like USDT or USDC. I mean, they, they don't actually have to do anything. <laughs> um, you know, they can do things if you want to get more kind of interesting smart contract functionality around them and programmability around them. But they can just be kind of representation of of what the underlying is. Now, the the cooler things where we get excited about in tokenization is everything else. Um, so there's a lot of you know there's a lot of very large sets of assets in the world that are not easy to buy. You know, so we're just starting to see like in the traditional world, you see now we're seeing a bunch of like rare art funds popping up, collectible car funds. You know, like buying like you know twenty million dollar Ferraris and into like fund structures. All of those things are actually really brilliant financial assets. Ultra rare art has gone up like 15% a year for 30 years. Uh, it's an amazing asset, but if, unless you can go buy a Monet, it's it's really hard to access that now, but that, that's kind of changing into those kind of financial assets. And I think all of that will, be, will quickly be tokenized and brought you know, kind of on chain also. Uh, and then you look at like the real estate market, which is also another, you know, a lot of reads, um, but there's also a lot of ways you cut that market more interestingly. Um, I think someday we will get to the point where everyone's home will be tokenized. You want to sell your house, you hand them the token. Uh, you want to sell fractions of your house because someone wants to speculate on your neighborhood. You can sell them certain things. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of platforms doing that. Um, there's all sorts of other again, interesting financial products out there. So that, that's really where I think tokenization will be the, the interesting side of it, not just you know how do we bring the, the, the big assets online. So just being mindful of time, we've got about 12 minutes, but we did receive another question. I'm going to insert it here because you did mention USDT a few times. And that question was, there's been rumors around USDT about that it was possibly going to depeg. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, that rumor has been there since since it launched. Um, so I was the, you know, I did joy, well, I, I, I was one of the earliest investors in Tether back in 13. Uh, the company. And then after after that, the company was sold to the the founders of Bitfinex. Um, so I have nothing to do with Tether much anymore. Um, so, but yeah, but no, I mean, you know, Tether is is supposedly in the next like two months or so. There, the Tether's gotten way more transparent. You know, it's ninety six billion dollars. I think ninety five of that or ninety four of that is now in just U.S. T bills. You know, which is very, you know, which is great. <laughs> They're still unwinding. You know, in the, in the past, they did some, you know, non-transparent things. They bought everything from like commercial debt paper and and bit and crypto assets, and speculated on crypto assets with the treasury and whatnot. And you know, and, it, and they did that when we were in a very low interest rate environment and they wanted to make money. They were greedy, quite frankly. Um, it wasn't great for the industry. Uh, since then, you know, five percent on T bills times ninety six billion dollars is is plenty of money. You know, they're making five billion dollars a year doing it the right proper way in a very in a much more transparent way. So I think they're going to be happy, even at three percent. It's still a phenomenal amount of money. Uh, so I think they're going to be pretty happy doing you know that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I you know again, there's always been these you know rumors that they're going to go. You know, someone's going to run off the ninety six billion dollars. It's hard to run off with. 96 billion dollars but you, you know or or maybe the assets really aren't there i think that's been pretty well debunked at this point you know i, I don't see any real systemic risk to tether anymore in the industry uh fortunately we did you know in late 2020 when they were like mostly in you know you know subprime government pay, you know subprime like uh real estate debt and <laughs> and whatnot i thought there was you know had the world gone a different direction and we got into a big recession in 20 or worst recession in 2020, I think that could have gone really, really badly for them. But since then, they seem to have gotten out of everything. So I, I think Tether is fine. I mean, I, I wish they were more transparent. Um, they, you know, uh, as a, they ran it more kind of philanthropically for the good of the crypto community. I think it would be an amazing product. And I think it would be a, you know, be a trillion dollar product, not a hundred billion dollar product. 
um, because it's a great product. It is the bell, the you know the, the gold standard of crypto uh, right now. I mean, USDC is is there, but if USDC can't. They, they block the IP addresses that USDC can trade. So if you're in the US or you know a lot of the first world, USDC is great. If you're in emerging markets, there's a different risk <laughs> that kind of keeps it out of a lot of emerging markets. And they also took it out of a lot of the exchanges, so it's much harder to access in a lot of emerging markets. Um, but you know, and I think there's gonna be a better version of Tether coming. So one random side I'll throw out there is we spent a lot of time with the state of Wyoming. This is all public. Uh, state of Wyoming is issuing their own stable coin. Uh, they are probably the most crypto positive states in the country by far. Uh, they're the ones that wrote all the specialized legislation for having you know specialized crypto banking and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so, and they're they're doing this as a way. They wrote this in the bill as a way to challenge the you know the risk they see of China doing their stablecoin and pipe, piping it around the world through all their mobile apps and everything. Uh, so they're going to create a U.S. dollar-based stablecoin in Wyoming. Uh, it'll likely pay interest in kind, which is pretty cool. Uh, so think of it kind of like a like a muni bond almost. Um, they they passed all the laws that they have to do this. Of course, it's behind schedule. Um, and, but I think it could be an amazing product. You know, most people don't realize Wyoming is actually the wealthiest state in the nation. Um, they have all these shale oil rights and things. So they have a, they have a, they're, they have a $26 billion surplus in Wyoming. I think they might be the only state with a surplus. Like California has got a, whatever, hundred trillion billion dollar deficit. Um, <laughs> you know, so they have a huge surplus. They're very serious about this. I've met with the, the governor of Wyoming more, twice so far to kind of help give advice on this project. And it would be really powerful. And I think, you know, again, the world, the emerging world desperately wants U.S. dollars. And so, you know, Tether is scary to a lot of people. If it And USDC is scary if you're in certain, you know, whatever <laughs> uh, IP addresses by country codes. Um, but if there is a proper financial product that has huge transparency, every, you know, the money has already been agreed to be managed by BlackRock and JP Morgan and uh, this project. Uh, like it's, you know, I think that actually will become a many trillion dollar stable coin. Uh, and it'll, it'll make a fortune for the state of Wyoming. And David, this is a perfect segue into the last topic, which I know is future outlook. Just letting you know about time. We've got about seven minutes remaining. Sure. Maybe go to the next slide if yeah, and this is um so so I'll, I'll be, I've talked about a lot of this already. I mean, there's a lot of tailwinds right now that I think are are pretty incredible for this asset class. I mean, I've I've been here a long time. I'm not quite as exuberant as I was in early 21 today, but um I think you know longer term we're we're so much better up. You know, you just got to go down the list. I mean, the financial institutions globally are are ready to partake in this asset, with a few exceptions. You know, but the, I think those exceptions will only be exceptions for another year or less. I mean, the vanguards and Merrill Lynch and, and whatnot, you know, saying we're not even going to let people touch these ETFs. I, I can't imagine that lasts very long because it's just it's just it's money. <laughs> you know, these are these are these are not, um, you know, these are not like government institutions. They're they're for profit companies. You know, when if Bitcoin does go on a bull run in the next year, which I'm pretty confident it will, it's gonna be really hard for Vanguard to say still that they're, you know, there's a lot of heat around it that they're not gonna allow anyone to touch these products. Uh, I just don't think that works out, uh, or that, that, that's never been the case in the past. Say it that way. Um, so I think there's, you know, and, and I think that also public sentiment is just totally changed. You know, about three months ago, I was having dinner with you know one of the biggest, actually the biggest. Uh, sovereign wealth funds in the world um, out, of Abu Dhabi, out of Abu Dhabi. And, um, you know, they were talking about the ETF. There's like, you know, we wanted to, we, you know, there's been a group of people within our organization that really wanted to hold more digital assets, uh, which they hold zero of. Uh, and they just couldn't get approval to do so. Uh, and then once the ETF looked really real, they were like, okay, that's it. The SEC approves the Bitcoin ETFs. You know, we're going to go buy Bitcoin. Uh, and, and just just a change of sentiment, and that, that was a you know whatever uh, I think it was like a three trillion dollar organization. So that, you know, so them putting you know half a point, <laughs> you know, into this asset class is you know fifteen whether it be fifteen billion dollars. It's more than all the minor rewards each year, you know, and that that's one. Uh, and there's a bunch of others that we're just seeing kind of this sea change that are all now realizing they they probably will need to own some of these assets. Uh, so that's huge. Um, the technology continues to advance at a really fast clip. I talked about a lot of the tools that are built in DeFi. You know, they're just getting better. You know, to me, the, the future of crypto, as I said before, is exactly that. That you know, we we are going to rebuild every aspect of the financial markets without intermediaries and where transactions cost you know less than a penny. Um, you know, I mean, you know, people are still paying you know twenty five dollar wire fees. 
you know, <laughs> you know, all, all of that is going to go away, I think, in the next five years, even in the first world. Um, you know, I mean, I, maybe the election will have an impact. Who knows? Um, I, I, I think we'll probably see a lot of changes before then. And then I think we're finally, you know, there's always some correlation between risk assets in, in different um, parts of the financial world. Um, you know, we've seen that correlation really break down. It mostly breaks down on the negative side for crypto um, recently, but I think we're now also seeing it break in, on the positive side um, that, you know, that this is going to be its own asset class. It's not going to just be one of the risk assets in the world. You know, it has, it has its own tailwinds. It has its own narratives. Um, so seeing the correlation break down is, is a high positive. Uh, it was always weird to everyone in crypto just how correlated, you know, Bitcoin was to NASDAQ. It's not the same technology, as but it's not really the same thing. But we're we're finally seem to have broken that cycle pretty powerfully. Um, and then the last thing, I don't know if this is, yeah, you look at the users chart on the left. Um, I think it tails off a little too fast. I, I think that I don't think I, I think the projections of what number of users touching Bitcoin and owning crypto assets natively it is just going to go more exponential than this. Because uh, you look at the emerging markets. You know, they have no banking, they have no money. You know, they're in some countries they use their phone load as currency because the local currency is garbage. Uh, you know, you, you know, there, there's so many, you know, there, most people don't really fathom how much of the world looks like a barter economy, you know, and it's it's billions of people living in these almost barter economies where they get paid and because their currency goes down so fast, they buy anything, paper towels, a can of soup, like they have to spend the money right away because every month it's 10% less and at least can of soup is a can of soup, you know, six months from now. Um, that's how they save, <laughs> you know? So I think you know, you'll see billions of people adopt this and it's also easy. I mean, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not easy in a sense of like, it's all cryptocurrencies and it's hard and walls are kind of complicated, you know, but when you have nothing else, <laughs> you know, you will figure it out. And there's plenty of smartphones in the world that can manage it, that can handle these kind of transactions. It's actually safer than paper money. You know, if someone steals your phone that you can you can transfer your wallet, you know, use a seed phrase and transfer your wallet back better than someone stealing your wallet, uh, which happens a lot in the developing world. Um, so I think we're just going to see this, this massive growth in users. And in a lot of the states, a lot of the countries are doing wonderful things, you know, like China rolling out their own stable coin and forcing everyone to use it is really great. You now put a wallet that can handle cryptocurrencies in everyone's hand. Uh, and you've told them that this is the best type of money. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty powerful thing. And we're seeing that kind of everywhere. I mean, all of the Middle East countries are coming out with lots of different payment wallets and whatnot, their own, you know, that um, that some a lot of them have a huge surveillance built into them, just like China's, but but they're all crypto wallets, you know, and they're they're gonna put those in you know, middle, you know, billion people in the Middle East are gonna have crypto wallets with digital assets in them. Uh, that the government's gonna give them and they're gonna use they're talking about using those wallets for, you know giving out donation, like the whatever, you know, whatever welfare checks and, and everything else um, is going to be, it's going, all going to be tokenized. Um, so, so I think, and so I think the, you know, the world is really bright. I love the asset class we're in. So, yeah. Thank you, David. So we do actually have a couple of questions. I know we're at time, uh, but let's go ahead and jump into them. You pretty much addressed this question, but if you've got any extra thoughts, throw them in there, which is, for the last couple of years, crypto was correlated with tech stocks. Is that going to continue? If so, if so, how does that affect trends? Yeah, yeah, I think I gave my answer. I mean, there's always going to be some risk asset correlation. That's that's just life. Um, and we're in a very high interest rate environment. I mean, I, I, I we're we're having a nice recovery right now in crypto. I mean, it, it we're still pretty far off the highs. But I can't imagine. I, I do think that where interest rates, you know, one percent become one percent again suddenly. Um, you would just see an explosion, you know, I mean, I, I think all risk assets, even the stock market, you know, is largely being held down right now. Again, it's hitting all time highs. So who knows? Uh, but so are profits. <laughs> Thanks to you know, some whatever uh, blame inflation. Um, so, you know, we're seeing so, you know, I, I do think that a ton of, uh, of dollars are sitting in, in T bills at 5% that as soon as that becomes, you know, 1%, which it absolutely will become again. You know, I mean, we live in this inflated world where every government can't pay high interest rates. So they'll they'll find ways to bring the interest rates down because it destroys them. And God knows they're not going to raise taxes uh, and actually pay down the debts. Um, so I, I so interest rates will go back down to one percent. And then all that money that's sitting in bonds and everything, which includes me and whatnot, it has to go somewhere. 
you know, and I think that'll actually obviously push up stocks, but I think it'll also push up every other asset. You know, so I, you know, I don't know when this everything bubble will end, <laughs> you know, but if they do lower interest rates, that won't be when, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, people, people will buy houses again. I mean, you know, over inflated prices. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're in this weird place that until there is a massive crash, um, I, I just see a lot of positivity for everything. So for those of you who can stay on the call, we do have two more questions, and that is the market caps versus actual revenues, especially regarding altcoins. Do you sometimes fear that market caps are out of touch versus its potential? Of course. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, if you look at it that way, um, I mean, the, the one kind of knock on crypto always has been that all of these projects, you know, take one like Solana is, is, is uses a good straw man. You know, transaction fees are like a fraction of a penny, which is great if you're using Solana and you want to, it's great for product platform adoption and whatnot, but it means there's very little revenue, <laughs> you know, meaning like if you can do a transaction for a 10th of a cent, you know, how many transactions do you need to support a $50 billion, you know, market cap, you know, you need this ungodly numbers of transactions, you know, but, but it probably, I think it will get there. I mean, it, I, I also think we'll be in a world not too far from now where everything is on chain. You know, and, and, I, and I do think we're going to see that world, especially in emerging markets, you know, in the next like five years, you know, I mean, we're literally every purchase, every transfer, every time you make a phone call practically is going to hit some kind of ledger. Uh, and it might be, you know, a tenth of a cent, might be a thousand, ten, ten thousandth of a cent. Um, and I think those prices will be, there'll be a war on, on lower transaction costs. Um, but as everything gets tokenized, the transaction costs aren't really the bottleneck. You know, there's transaction speeds are bottlenecks, and there's a lot of things that have to happen technologically to make all that work. Um, but today, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, I mean, again, you look at all the transaction fees on Solana. You know, I, I, you know, you certainly don't get to like even a hundred million dollars a year. Uh, I think it's probably like closer to ten or something. I haven't done the math in a long time. Um, but it's a fifty billion dollar token. So you know, how do you justify that? But the, the only, it, it's a speculative asset. The only justification is, and I don't think this is the case. But if Solana is the token, <laughs> you know, that ends up processing, you know, twenty percent of all financial transactions globally, and it does it at a hundredth of a penny, that's still enough, uh, enough money uh, that it could be that it could be worth that valuation. So I have an amazing question actually to end our presentation, and that is how are the wave portfolios, Genesis, NFF, and C Fund positioned to benefit from emerging trends in the blockchain space? Which investments are likely to have the most impact on future performance? And I promise I did not write this question. This came in from an audience member. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um so, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, on the early stage VC fives, I'll, I'll, and I'll split the question between. So, so C Fund, which is the Cardano ecosystem fund we manage, uh, and and Wave Maker Gen Wave Genesis is the kind of you know more generic fund we started the company with. Yeah, you know, those are very focused on what you saw in the previous slide. You know, where you know real world assets are going to find their way into crypto in a million different places. There's going to be all sorts of new financial products that'll become crypto native products, uh, and and that's really where we focus. So we have. And I think from an SEC standpoint, I'm not supposed to name our favorite portfolio companies, not name our least favorite or something. There's like some weird rules, but you know, there's a whole bunch of investments we have kind of around those theses. Uh, what do you need for that to work? You need we call decentralized identification, which is a persistent ID that people you kind of get, but it is known. It, it it interacts with like you know, it has an API into like NetKey or one of the AML KYC providers. So it kind of bear it so. You know, so the exchange knows you are verified and they receive a, a message from NetKey. Yes, this person is accredited investor, but they don't actually need to know your name or where you live or, or, or so on and so forth. So I think that's that's one huge aspect. There's another big part of it is just the platforms themselves. There's, you know, we, we do need regulated platforms to, to at least, you know, in the near term <laughs> uh, to absorb all the money from the first world. And, 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 and all those look like everything. There's, you know, hundreds of different concepts you could back there all sorts of different lending type protocols, exchanges, derivative exchanges. You know, once you think, once we get like the basic things into the crypto world and you have to think of all the exotic financial products that people will also want and, and hedge, hedging products and everything else. Uh, so there's a ton we're, we're focused on there. Out of time. Uh, so with that said, I wanted to thank the audience members for staying pretty much through the entire event. David Seymour, you are awesome and such a wealth of knowledge. Um, ben, sorry we missed you this time. Maybe we'll have another <laughs> webinar with you just on okay. there. 
Um, with that said, I believe we will be hosting more of these. And if any of you found this useful and you're not already subscribed to our newsletter, please subscribe um, so we can get some more of this really useful information out to you. So thank you so much, David. Thank you, Ben. Did you have any last words? Oh, oh I think they covered everything. So we're all good. Well, here's to an amazing 2024, an amazing bowl year, right? So <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.